Happy Friday and happy International Women's Day, a day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. I don't want to put a dampener on things, but PwC's Women in Work Index, which we publish annually, shows the UK is being outpaced by other countries in progress towards gender equality at work. This is particularly true when it comes to the gender pay gap, which has increased to 14.5%, a whole percentage point higher than the OEC average. I'm Letitia Lynn, Head of Reputation and External Affairs at PDC. I'm delighted to be joined by one of the authors of research, Divya Shrita, economist at PwC, and Katie Bennett, director of PwC, who advises organisations on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I'm really looking forward to discussing the issues this throws up. Um, before I start, if um, you'd like captions to this um, live stream, just tap the top three, the three dots at the top of your um, window, and there's an option there. Um, before we delve into the reasons we're doing so poorly on gender pay um, equality, I want to make sure I'm clear on the terminology when we refer to the gender pay gap. Um, Divya, what exactly do we mean by this? Yeah, sure. So the gender pay gap, when we say the gender pay gap, we mean the difference in average earnings between what men earn and what women earn. And when we talk about average earnings, there's obviously different ways to measure this. So the data we use in our research is from the OECD that looks at median difference in earnings between men and women. That's different to other data sources, um, also different to the UK's kind of mandatory reporting data as well. So while the gender pay gap is a useful measure, it's looking at it in average terms. And what I mean by that is we're not able to compare like for like. So there may be other differences behind that average figure that could explain the difference in pay. So difference in educational qualifications between men and women, differences in the kind of industries that they work in. So what we've tried to do this year in our research is to go one step ahead and look behind the gender pay gap and try to achieve a like for like comparison as much as possible with kind of the data that we have available. And what we're calling that is the gender pay penalty. So that looks at comparing if you account for different factors that could drive pay, such as education, kind of industries, occupation, all of that sort of things, if we can control for that, what is the pay differential? And what we find is that there is quite a large um, pay differential that persists up to almost 10%. And what that basically means is for every pound earned by a man, on average, an equally qualified woman with similar background characteristics, both, both personal and professional, still only makes 90p on average. Wow. Um, I mean, it's hard not to feel aggrieved by this. And I'm sure actually if we've got men listening, they'll feel the same on behalf of friends and partners. Um, Tivia, what's, what's driving this, this disparity? Yeah, so to dig deeper into kind of why this is such a large figure, we looked at how this pay penalty or the kind of difference in pay when we account for some of these other factors changes depending on the different stages of a woman's career and a woman's life. So firstly, we looked at age. And what we found was that the pay penalty actually increases with age. So when you kind of enter the workforce or when a woman enters the workforce, the pay penalty she faces is around 5% on average. And if we take that through up to the stage in which she's likely to leave the workforce closer to the end of her kind of career, the pay penalty actually widens and reaches up to 13%. And we then looked at kind of why this is the case and what happens with age as we track a woman's career. And we find that the kind of first kind of jump in the pay penalty happens when we move from the 16 to 30 year old age group to the 31 to 45 year old age band. And a key kind of difference that happens there is likely to be motherhood. Um, so the average kind of age in the UK when um, a woman gives birth to her first child is around 31 years. And this is probably also likely the time when she is going to be taking maternity leave, taking some time off and potentially taking a longer career break. And we've seen evidence that there is a motherhood penalty that comes into play here. And we've seen this both in our own research from previous years and also a number of other studies. And what we find here is that kind of women's earnings never end up recovering and this pay disparity persists and only widens as a woman rejoins the career and goes through her career. OK, so just so I'm sort of doubly clear, if we take two economists, you <coughs> and Divya, one a woman, the other a man, both of whom are parents with the same qualifications, both working full time, we can assume that on average the man has essentially been able to devote more time um, to his role, his career, and seen kind of career and 
kind of paid benefits as a result. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, I'd like to bring Katie in here because this must be a minefield for employers. Because if, I mean, if a man or a woman has given 100% um, to their career, I mean, they would surely feel rightly entitled to earn more if through, I guess, working longer hours, kind of no career breaks. Um, yeah, they've, they've been able to have more impact. I guess, how do employers address the pay penalty without causing unfairness in other ways? Yeah, I mean, it, it is an incredibly complicated area. And, you know, this, this data is kind of bringing together what we can see is happening as, at a societal level. But when we kind of zoom in to an individual employer, um, what we'll hopefully see is that we're not seeing two people doing exactly the same role being paid differently. Um, that would be you know, illegal in the UK. But absolutely, we are seeing these kind of macro trends that we see in society playing through. And, you know, employers can do things to support women and indeed men who choose to be parents. Um, you know, there are some kind of obvious pieces around the policies they have in place around leave, around provisions for potentially for emergency childcare, um, but also thinking really carefully about what they ask of their employees and if they give people sufficient time and sufficient flexibility and sufficient space, actually, to say, you know, here's how I balance things to have a successful career. Um, there is also actually a really important part to bringing um, men, to bringing fathers into these conversations and saying, actually, an awful lot of what this comes down to is the... The, the lack of equality and how that, um, you, I mean, you could call it a burden, but I'm a parent and I try and, <laughs> I think maybe sometimes we get a bit negative in our language about, about that experience, though it, it is pretty hard at times, but how that responsibility is shared and that actually were we to see better support for fathers to use that flexibility to, to mix their career with with their, their, their personal responsibilities, then actually some of that would move off women, but also perhaps some of the biases, some of the restrictions that sometimes come through or the assumptions about what being a successful career person and a parent is would start to change too. That's really interesting, Kate. I guess, but what about um, choice? Because many women, you know, will actively seek more work-life balance and kind of don't want to miss out on their children's formative years. I know I didn't. And Katie, I guess it gets back to your point as kind of framing it as a penalty and whether that could misrepresent um, what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think across this whole agenda, language is so important and it's so easy to, to let the language lead the debate or to create assumptions and bias and let, lead to this kind of ironic circle where you're perpetuating um, bias through the language you're trying to use to describe it um, and it is important to recognize that it's a choice to recognize that many people are are not parents choose not to be parents um, and that women experience a lot of this you know the data says that women experience this regardless of if they become parents but but that penalty language you know it, it's it's interesting and I think you're you're right Letitia it does kind of I think it can take away the element of choice. But I also wonder or worry, I have no data on this, so apologies, this is just my kind of musings, if it risks perpetuating some of those societal assumptions. So if I go into deciding to become a parent, assuming that as a woman, as a mother, it will have a negative impact on my career because it's a penalty, whether or not I think that's right, um, then maybe I'll be less likely to call out bias to, to say, well, why can't I have that development opportunity? Because I'll sort of, I'll have gone in with the except with the expectation that was going to happen. Um, and similarly, maybe my husband will not think about the career impact for him and will not kind of put the piece forward because there's this assumption that it's all about mothers. And so I think that's a really important thing to think about because what we need to say is the, the gold standard is that everyone can make the choice that, that they that they wish to and find a way to 
be successful in their life, which is their careers, plus their personal life. And, you know, that, that hopefully employers and government and society don't create expectations about what that looks like. That's a really good point, Katie. I guess that this whole issue of sort of societal norms, and because currently there is so much expectation on it being the mother's role still, I guess quite a lot needs to be done to sort of nudge it or kind of move it significantly back in the other direction. Is there a is there a risk here that in highlighting this sort of um, imbalance, do I actually think go too far in the other direction and actually you know employers use it as an excuse to offer less to women to mothers um because they feel that would be it would be kind of perpetuating this so are you seeing any kind of evidence of, of that at the moment katie um so so i'm pleased to say that isn't a big trend that i'm seeing i think the reality is that it's it's still a small percentage of of organizations that are really thinking hard about some of this and because they're the organizations most committed to change often they're focused more on how do they you know level up for for fathers level up for everybody um i i think where we are seeing again positive change but also bigger considerations is you know we all know that the experience of the last few years has really transformed uh the use of hybrid and flexible working um, which can be really positive for lots of different people with lots of different life experiences, including parents and carers. Um, historically, there's always been a real worry about the bias that that creates. So am I, as a manager, more likely to think somebody I see every day is a better performer because I see them? Um, and what hopefully having broader experiences of this and having to think about productivity and how you measure that in a hybrid world will actually hopefully try and kind of pull apart some of those biases. But, you know, that's still emerging. So that's me being hopeful on International Women's Day to, to, to kind of counterbalance some of this data. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. I mean, it's not just motherhood, is it, that's driving this disparity? Um, I know the research shows an additional pay penalty for women in the 46 to 65 year old bracket, um, kind of, for instance. Um, Divya, yeah, can you can you tell us some of the active factor, other factors at play here? Yeah, absolutely. So exactly like you and Katie have said, motherhood is only part of the puzzle. And I think our analysis shows just that. So as you were saying, when we look at that kind of final age band of 45 to 65 year olds, we find that the pay penalty widens even further up to 13%. So there are a couple of um, reasons that could be driving this. The first one is kind of health related issues, one of which includes the menopause. So what we find in terms of the data is that on average, women in the UK enter menopause between the ages of 45 and 55 year olds. So that ties in quite closely with that age band where we see that jump in the pay penalty or the pay difference between men and women. Research has shown that 50% of women state that their ability to work or perform at their job is impacted by menopause related symptoms. So that's basically saying one out of every two women state that there is an impact they feel with these health related issues. When we compare that to the women who actually feel like they're getting the support they need from employers, it's not a great picture. So 80% of women from surveys across the UK have said that there's a lack of support or just any guidance or resources shared by employers on things like menopause related absences, kind of flexible working um, resources, or just kind of where they can have a start to look at what they can do when they're going through these kind of symptoms. And what that really shows for us is that menopause and other health related conditions are likely driving some of these pay penalties that we see at the higher age group and that they go ahead and impact career progression, compensation and also access to opportunities at work for women in that 45 plus age band. I mean, I think just what you were saying about menopause, it kind of links to Katie's earlier comment that there's a kind of danger of, I guess, reinforcing stereotypes um, Katie, I don't know if you've got any kind of thoughts about that and how employers deal with deal with this. Yeah, I I, I agree, and it's again, it goes back to this language point, doesn't it? And how do mm. we, you know, I think the absolute expansion in the number of conversations about menopause and de uh, demystifying is. I mean, maybe for some people it is demystifying is the right word, but, you know, really making it something that people should should talk about and should recognise is, you know, a normal experience that 
many, not all, but many women go, you know, go through in work and outside of work. And that's got to be a positive. But we know that older women still experience the most kind of discrimination and bias just around perceptions. Mm. And that's where we need to be really careful to recognize that, yes, there is a percentage of women who, where, you know, their menopause symptoms do really impact them and they absolutely need the right support at work. And that can be very practical support. You know, I know um, PwC an employ- as an employer has a number of different policies, has different networks and initiatives, including well-being, kind of active support and advice to help with that. But at the same time, we need to be clear that, you know, women who are experiencing me- menopause and older women who are not are incredible knowledge banks of experience and expertise and they are leaders and you know we need to make sure we don't lose the focus on that because it's easy it's the same as with motherhood right it's easy to to allow the conversation to become about a woman's other role or her body rather than about the amazing professional that she is and again and again, Divya, there are other factors, aren't there, beyond, you know, beyond kind of health? And uh, as you get older, I think one of the things I was really interested in the report is this reference to the kind of, um, I guess, being the sandwich generation and, you know, just left motherhood behind or the caring responsibilities that come with that. And bang, you're kind of hit with caring for elderly parents. Yeah, exactly. So I came across this kind of term sandwich generation for the first time in the, when I was working on this report as well. And it was super interesting um, to read about it in studies, because I think we've all seen it happen live with people that we know in our own families as well. Um, so with the sandwich generation, what we're talking about is basically women in that 45 plus age band are often kind of hit with a double whammy in terms of um, caring responsibilities. So they've got caring duties for kind of younger family members as well, potentially kind of motherhood penalties extending onto that age as well. And then they've also got kind of caring responsibilities for older family members. And this kind of hits them at a time when they're also facing, as we just spoke about and what Katie was talking about as well, health related challenges of themselves. So they're kind of in between there with caring responsibilities for two sides of the spectrum and they themselves facing kind of a stage in their life where they're going to need more um, care for themselves as well. So that I think also comes into play in terms of what's driving that wider pay penalty for women, particularly in that 45 plus age band. And I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm totally like going off topic, but you just, you just sort of sparked something for me. I think we're talking so much about caring and obviously the, the caring industry is itself predominantly made up of Um, female workers who are often paid not very much money and you know clearly we're not going to go into the kind of the the political here but there are lots of questions about the funding of caring whether that be early years professionals those caring for older people those in the in the kind of um, elder elder care or kind of hospital settings and I think that's a really important part of this to recognize too which is not only we see penalties but we're also seeing that those industries where there are lots of women are often those that are less um, valued economically even though they are performing a sterling economic job because I would not be talking right now if it wasn't for the women who work in the nursery where I send my son no, it, 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 it's such a it's such a good point. I mean, I suppose we're looking at pay levels um, and actually the kind of perhaps insufficient pay for some of those really important roles. I think it links to another point in the report that actually the, the pay penalty is actually higher for women in higher income groups. So again, it's really kind of complex kind of what's going on here. And I suppose it's is it simply that the more you earn, I suppose, the more you have to lose um, if your career is set back? Yeah, that is kind of what it looks like when you look at the data in the first finding. So we find when we go across and look at not only what is the pay penalty across the UK women on average, but look at it in income bands, we find the largest pay penalty comes up at the top 25% income band. So women earning in that top bracket are now facing pay penalties as up as large as up to 12%. So if we go back to that kind of 90p figure, what that means is if you're in that top income band, for every pound that a man is earning, you're earning 88p on average. 
even though you've got similar backgrounds, both in terms of professionally and personally. And if we think about kind of why that's the case, we see two key reasons coming out. The first one is this phenomenon called the greedy jobs phenomenon. And that was introduced by Claudia Goldwyn in her Nobel Prize winning work earlier last year. And how she defines greedy jobs are basically jobs that require long, unpredictable hours, kind of, for example, working late into the evenings, working on weekends, last minute demands on your time. So a last minute work trip, kind of unpredictable, demanding um, hours. And what studies have shown and what Golden finds in her research as well is that men are just better able to find the time to address these greedy jobs. So they're able to give more time to kind of ad hoc um, work requests and they're also be able to be more flexible. And a lot of the reason as to why there's a gap between men's ability to respond to these greedy jobs versus women is this unequal split of unpaid care work. And we find that because of these greedy jobs and we find a lot more greedy jobs happen at higher income levels, men do benefit in a way that women don't, and this drives this pay disparity even wider. Another reason that we find is what we've called a gender gap in negotiation. So when we think about kind of how likely men and women are to negotiate pay, a number of kind of studies have found that men are much more likely to negotiate their pay offers when they're either getting promoted or um, being hired in the first place as compared to women. And if we think about kind of why that could be the case. It is what's come out from studies is that there is a higher social cost when women negotiate their pay. And what I mean by social cost is kind of risk of alienating your employer. So when you're kind of entering that negotiation situation, studies have shown that it's much more likely for employers to kind of be put off by women negotiating pay as compared to men. So that kind of already goes into why women are less likely to negotiate, negotiate pay in the first place. Absolutely. And I guess that's that's so important when you think about like the knock on impact that, of that over years, because, OK, you negotiate your pay on day one, but then that's the starting salary at which your future pay increases are um, determined. And then if exactly. you go for a new job, what sometimes happens still in the UK, it's not legal in some other countries, is that the first question that get asked is, well, what are you currently paid? So it, it's it's a kind of. It's not just an in-year moment, momentary impact, right? It's year on year on year. Yeah, yeah. consistently throughout. I can see how it compounds and kind of going for a new job. It gives you such a sort of a head start. But, Nietzsche, I guess, are employers really listening to those who shout loudest when it comes to negotiation? I mean, is it, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of horrifying, really, to think of it in that way, actually, that, um, I mean, it's, it's really hard to measure that, right? It's very hard to, to kind of really be sure exactly what's going on. I think um, certainly in recent years, we've seen a number of big employers really trying to tighten up pay to try and stop that happening. Because as, as boring as a solution as it is, governance comes really into this. If you say, well, this is how much this job gets paid, we have no room for nego negotiation. You negate a lot of that impact, um, but but you know there is a there is a piece. Ultimately, we we know that people tend to react best to people who are similar to them, and you know if the way that you were successful was by negotiating, by shouting the loudest, then without challenge and without reflection, the automatic thing to do might be to think, well, you know, they're a real go-getter. They, they came to me and told me all the reasons they were brilliant. Nobody else said they were brilliant. So that person must be brilliant. And, you know, it's, it's easy when you talk about it in this room with, with, with all of us who think about this topic to go, well, that's ridiculous. But I think it's important to reflect this is about individuals making individual decisions who are not bringing a bias or a diversity or an equity lens to this and are not thinking about the knock-on effect of this happening thousands of millions of times. And, and that's important to think about. There is, I guess, Katie, quite a grey area between... I suppose these sorts of unconscious biases, if you like, and sort of discrimination here. And I know there's sort of research cited in our index um, by the Young Women's Trust, which says that many HR decision makers are aware of women being discriminated against. 
Um, and I just wondered your view, yeah, your, your, I guess your views here on are there, I mean, one would like to hope instances of discrimination are, re- are rare, it's illegal as you, as you say, but um, is, is, there more, is there more going on here than meets the eye? I mean, I, I, think, I think you're right. I would, I would like to hope and I, I believe that we're not seeing huge amounts of, of unrecognised, undealt with discri- active discrimination happening, um, certainly from a, a gender perspective. And I, th- I think what we're really seeing is, and it's, it's kind of the, what's coming out in this a- analysis, is that a lot of the disparities, a lot of the gap we're seeing, it's not about me as a manager going into a room and saying, you're a man, you must be better at your job. That's, it's not as simple as that. It's actually the, the piling on impact of, well, somebody is able to take that last minute trip which is when they get to go in front of the most important client which is when they get the incredible feedback which justifies their pay rise and promotion nobody said they're better because they're a man but actually the conditions in which they live and we all live because of lots of other things within an employer but within wider societal expectations access to different opportunities means that there is still a disparity at times in who gets access to different jobs and that's not just you know kind of in in those specific scenarios where we're talking about being a parent but actually you know if we look at something we talk about see a lot in in the analysis we do with organizations is what we call occupational segregation some skills some types of work are more commonly done by women and some by men and for whatever reason the market has determined that certain skills are more valuable and they are almost always skills that are more commonly done by men you know and until we and sorry I'm trying to think about how to term this but you know so if you take a step back and say is it okay that an economist is paid more than an HR professional. You might say, yes, that's okay, because an economist has a greater value in the market. And when I look at what everybody else is paying an economist, it's more money. So of course it's okay that PwC pays an economist more than an HR professional. And to be clear, Divya and I have not been comparing salaries. (laughs) Purely um, theoretical. But actually, if you say, well, let's take a step back. HR professionals are way more likely to be female. Economists, I, I don't I haven't seen the data, I'm guessing, are way more likely to be yeah. male. Yeah. So actually, um, and you know, if we both have the same level of qualification in a different profession, well, what's the appropriate pay gap? Because that's really complicated. It is, it is really complicated. It's fantastic. I see our audience is, is kind of growing. And so I don't want to, I want to keep going for a little bit, but conscious we're, we're kind of running um, close to the end of time. A few issues I wanted to touch on. You mentioned almost like sectors and industries um, there, Katie. And then I love, Divya, your, your reference to the kind of greedy jobs, which makes me think instantly of kind of Wall Street and greed is good and all the rest mm. of it. And I wondered whether we see more evidence of these pay penalties in, say, financial services. Yeah, so we looked at our analysis from a sectoral perspective as well. Um, so financial services did stand out um, as kind of above average in terms of pay penalties. I think the two other sectors that really stood out for me were education and health. And just picking up on what Katie was saying about kind of carers and the health industry, initially this was quite surprising for me because, as you said, Letitia, I was expecting kind of FS, professional services, that to kind of stand out as number one. And when I think of education and health, I think of those as two sectors with many women in them. And I didn't think they'd come out top of the list in terms of sectors with the largest pay penalty. And I think that comes back to the greedy jobs point that we were just talking about. So when we think about the health sector or the education sector, looking into the data, when we did get this finding, we found that A, while there are lots of women in the sectors, many of those women do not occupy senior positions. So when Katie was talking about kind of voice in the room when these key decisions are being made, women are unlikely to be kind of equally represented there to start with. And then when we think about the greedy jobs phenomenon, we can think particularly in health, 
I think just after the pandemic, it's a kind of a great testament to the fact that some of the greediest jobs are likely to be in the health sector. And then when you think about women with these kind of unpaid care roles, are they able to then also answer to these greedy jobs and demands of these greedy jobs? Probably not as likely as a man would be able to. And when you think about those two things, it kind of suddenly becomes less of a surprise that both education and health are sectors where the pay penalties are actually quite wide, even if they are kind of female dominant sectors. It's very easy for this. I don't want this to turn into a, a rant. So I want to move on to, I guess, some of the more sort of positives. And actually, your research does look at the kind of economic benefits of having um, more women in work and also um I guess there are some countries that are doing kind of really well on this. Um, so perhaps I'll kind of wrap those two issues in into one, Divya, for you to answer. Yeah, absolutely. I think definitely let's look at the positives as well. So we've finally seen countries like Luxembourg and Iceland that have always come in top three on our index. And that's the same as this year as well with Luxembourg coming in first place. Um, what we've seen there in terms of policies that are working and are setting these countries apart takes us right back to what we're talking about in terms of care as well. So Iceland, for example, has one of the best kind of most generous and equal parental leave policies across all OECD countries. So in Iceland, you've got kind of 12 months paid parental leave. That's six months for the mother, six months for the father or six months for each parent. And out of those six months, you can only transfer a maximum of one month to your partner. So what that means is basically, irrespective of if you're a man or a woman, you're eligible at least five months and maybe six months of paid parental leave. And if you're not using those five months, it's not a case where you can transfer it to your partner and go back to work sooner. You just lose it. So with that use it or lose it policy, it's much more likely that you actually take this leave. And that comes through in the numbers as well. So if we look at the uptake of parental leave amongst fathers in Iceland, it's kind of 86 percent. And kind of comparing that to the UK, the UK, that number is in single digits. So you can kind of see that that kind of policy is really helping actually more fathers also take this paid parental leave option. And that does help balance out the kind of unpaid childcare duties right from the start when the child is born. And when we talk about kind of what are the positives, obviously, that is a huge positive just from kind of moving towards a more gender equal workplace. But what our kind of studies have found and our analysis have shown is that there's also kind of key economic benefits from a more gender equal workplace. So I'll kind of just talk about one example in terms of GDP boost, because obviously with the budget earlier this week and kind of the lot of the discussions around the UK economy, anything that could provide a boost to GDP is it's welcome in any year, but it's definitely welcome this year. And what we found is actually addressing this issue can be a key solution. So looking at kind of the GDP impacts, we find that if we were to say that even 5% more women join the workforce or remain in the workforce because it's more it's a more gender equal place to be, that could lead to a 125 billion boost to the GDP of the UK. And that's per year. So what we're saying here is it's not only great in terms of this is what it should be like pay parity isn't something we're going to have to need to justify. But even if you do think about what it could mean from an economic gains perspective, 125 billion boost to GDP is what we'd be looking at per year. Well, well, I think that is a great note to end on. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And thank you, to Divya. Thank you, Katie. Um, really enjoyable discussion and a lot of food for thought in time for lunchtime. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.